Ladies and gentlemen, colleagues and friends, good evening. It is evening session of Carl Jaspers Society of Northern America. Tonight, the book under discussion is From the Axial Age to the Moral Revolution. John Stuart Glenny, Carl Jaspers, and a new understanding of the idea. The author is Eugene Halton. He is, I guess, could be introduced as a sociologist, mm -hmm. maybe cultural anthropologist. Personally, I was deeply touched that you started your journey uh, study Shumeric culture, which is very mystical and very interesting. Jean begins as a pragmatist, as American pragmatism, connected firsthand with the father of American pragmatism. And now we discussing German existentialist. So that will be very interesting. We have three esteemed panelists. Victor Litz, sociologist, and I will introduce a little bit more uh, before his presentation. Uh, Benjamin Shevel, am I correct in phonics? Shul. Shul. Yeah. Thank you for correcting. And Christopher Pitt. And now it is my ultimate pleasure to give a mic to Jean. Thank you. Well, let me begin just by saying I am deeply honored to be here that uh, Helmut Wouter should put this together, uh, a discussion of my book, uh, the critics that are here. You know, it's rare that you have people who can understand you. <laughs> and all of these people understand what I was trying to say and raise, I think, really serious, important questions. And we'll be getting into that in a while. So I just want to start with thanking uh, my critics and Helmut and Elena for making this possible. Uh, I came to write this book a long ways back. I started out uh, in graduate school. The, I, I would be at parties drinking Sumerian beer sometimes from a clay tablet recipe uh, with people who are graduate students in Egyptology and Sumerology. My ex-wife was a student of Assyriology. And that's where I found myself with these people. And the question would come up, why do we feel a distance from Egypt and Babylon that we don't feel with Rome and Greece? And what's, you know, what is going on here? There was also a fellow at the time, Arnaldo Mimiliano, a historian who was giving lectures. I would go to coffee and hang out with him and at different occasions talk about issues of the Axial Age that he was writing on at that time. Uh, I also, as a graduate student, became interested in the work of Lewis Mumford who became a, a mentor figure for me. I was fortunate to meet with him a few times in his, late in his life. And he wrote on the Axial Age in his 1956 book, The Transformations of Man. And he pointed out in that book uh, Jasper's idea of the Axial Age. And he said, and this was discussed early in the century by John, uh, he said, uh, Glennie. But it's John Stuart Glennie. And Glennie, Stuart Glennie had discussed this in 1905, six, but he had discussed it much earlier. I knew about this. I wrote about it in a book of mine in 1995. I, I referenced John Stuart Glennie, but I never really got to read the works, to sit down and actually look at the works until, I don't know, about 2009 or so, eight or nine. And uh, I, I was just overwhelmed when I started to see uh, finding these books through Google because our library didn't have it. Stuart Glennie was born in 1841 and died in 1910. And he was well known in his lifetime. And he dropped off the face of the earth in 1910. Um, but I saw that he had the whole theory that y Jaspers had discussed, the same usual suspects, ancient Greece, ancient China, ancient Judaism, ancient India with Buddhism in, in particular. Uh, he had many of the same descriptions that Jaspers had used. And one of the things I find fascinating is the fact that uh, everybody that writes in the Axial Age knows about Jaspers, but uh, up until my book did not know about 
um, Stuart Glennie except for Mumford, but the Ospreys did not know about Stuart Glennie. So we have an independent verification of a sort that two people, without knowing each other, came to such similar conclusions on what the phenomenon that they were addressing was. Uh, the, Stuart Glennie gave a term in the moral revolution, the Oster is the axial age. Uh, in my book, I, I make the claim that we should credit Stuart Glennie as the first full theory. There are a couple of other people from earlier who had discussed the phenomena of the synchronicity of different civilizations, but they had not developed a whole uh, theory of it. And Jaspers gives credit to those in his, his book. Uh, Stuart Glenny, I don't know if he was unaware of them. He, he did not mention them. And so in writing this book, it was important to me to put Stuart Glenny out there, to come to, as best I could to try to describe his many times difficult ideas uh, so that he would be in the mix, so that people could come to their own interpretations and conclusions about it. I also wanted to bring Mumford into the picture because Mumford is someone who early on, 1956, was writing about Jaspers. Jaspers' book was published, Origin and Goal of History, in 1949 and translated into English in 1953. While writing the book, I had this experience of, as if it was like low-hanging fruit that I would pluck that nobody else had seen, of someone who had written on the Axial Age 20 years before Jaspers, a world-renowned author that no one knew had written on the phenomenon, D.H. Lawrence, in his last posthumously published book, Apocalypse. Uh, he presents a tragic view of the phenomena, quite different from those of Stuart Glennie and Jaspers and many other commentators. And so I realized this book, its primary purpose was to bring in Stuart Glennie to the picture, to take Mumford, who was a well-known public intellectual but not really ever discussed for his work on the Axial Age, and Lawrence, who was not discussed, bring them into the mix, and uh, that's, tonight is the discussion of the mix. So now they have a first critique, and we will be listening to Victor Litz, who is a sociologist, professor emeritus in the Department of Psychiatry, as Durkheim, I guess, at the Drexel University College of Medicine in Philadelphia. Previously, Victor taught at University of Chicago, University of Pennsylvania, had appointment at Haverford College and University of Innsbruck, so we have a lot of Austrian today. His publications have mainly concerned the theory of social action of Talcott Parsons, his principal teacher. Welcome, Victor. Thank you. Since Jean has set the model of uh, speaking a little autobiographically, uh, I want to say that my first engagement with the problems of the Axial Age came in the spring semester of my first year in graduate school when I was fortunate to uh, be a student in what we called the Grand Seminar, uh, since it was taught collaboratively by Talcott Parsons, Robert Bella, and Shmuel Eisenstadt. And uh, the turning point of that seminar, when sort of conceptually things began to uh, uh, become more rigorous and worked through, was uh, when Robert Bella uh, presented his schema of religious evolution, of several types of uh, uh, degrees of complexity of religious belief systems, uh, which he published the following year under the title Religious Evolution in the American Sociological Review. Uh, that paper uh, makes as a central theme that what Bella called the philosophic breakthrough, uh, which occurred in the era we call the Axial Age, and which he documented occurred in the several civilizations which uh, Jaspers uh, uh, identifies in his book. However, Bella uh, did not mention uh, Jaspers, as far as I can remember, uh, in the seminar, uh, nor did Parsons or Eisenstadt. And um, uh, uh, Bella's paper does not cite uh, Jaspers for his work on the Axial Age, 
but only for a book on the mythology of Christianity with Rudolf Bultmann. Uh, but so it's only later that uh, uh, Bella picked up uh, the reference to Jasper's work on the Axial Age as a key turning point in his own treatment of uh, religious evolution as we see in his uh, final masterwork on uh, religion and human evolution. So with those remarks, let me uh, quote from Jaspers. He says, today the attitude to history that knows it as an overseeable whole is being surmounted. No exclusive total outline of history is still capable of satisfying us. We do not obtain a final, but only a currently possible integument for the totality of history, which breaks up again. With this conception of the modern understanding of history, Jasper sets the frame of his own contribution to the philosophy of history sharply off against the frame that we find in Stuart Glenny's philosophy of history. Uh, Jean Halton's demonstration that Stuart Glenny's conception of the moral revolution antedates Jasper's conception of the axial age by three generations uh, is an important contribution to the growing literature on the axial age. It gives us a deeper perspective on the historical and theoretical complexities of the ways in which the religio-philosophical uh, breakthrough of the axial age has been identified, conceptualized, and valued. Yet considering differences between uh, Jaspers and Stuart Glenny's perspectives, uh, we should gain a richer understanding of why Jaspers conception of the axial age has been the greater stimulant to a growing scholarship. In the first volume of his Proemia, Stuart Glenny reviews philosophies of history. He demonstrates that an understanding of history is fundamental to Christianity, both for the belief in the fall of man, in Jesus as the turning point of all human existence, and in the anticipation of a time of final development, matters he treated as intimately connected. The ultimate philosophy of history is thus founded on a conceptual conception of mutual determination of idealistic and material factors of causation and change, a formulation he actually does little to explain. On this basis, he posited three stages of humanity. First were the early human societies and civilizations up to 600 BC. Uh, second, the civilization shaped by the moral revolution of the sixth century BC, uh, a revolution he considered essentially the same, whether in China, India, Iran, Judea, or Greece. Um, and uh, uh, he then gave particular attention to the emergence of Christianity and particular phases of its development, but no similar attention to the other civilizations. Uh, he uh, divided the civilization based on the moral revolution into 500 year periods in very interesting ways that Gene reviews in his book. But his analysis is entirely focused on Western civilization. So the third age was the new philosophy and science based civilization that had been emerging since the 16th century and was to be fully realized in the 20th century. His account of the emerging new civilization was similarly Western focused but anticipating current globalism. Um, now, um, I think that um, by contrast, uh, Jasper's uh, conception of the uh, axial age was very importantly uh, fixed by uh, his uh, relationship with Max Weber. Uh, which was very prominent early in his career before Weber's death. Uh, 
And um, in his uh, famous essay on Weber, he gives a very good account of Weber's methodology and also of Weber's uh, uh, account of the Protestant ethic and the spirit of capitalism. In just several pages, one of the very best accounts that exists in the literature. And um, he gives indication that he was familiar with uh, Weber's uh, comparative civilizational studies uh, published in his works on the sociology of religion. And in the great philosophers, the section on Socrates, Buddha, Confucius, and Jesus, uh, Jasper's calling them not charismatic individuals as Weber did, but paradigmatic individuals, uh, emphasizes that they set the frames for long developing traditions of philosophy in the separate civilizations. And moreover, uh, he emphasizes their, the differences among these paradigmatic individuals and the differences in the civilizations and philosophies that evolved uh, based upon their works. Uh, he emphasizes that these paradigmatic figures were not themselves uh, philosophers. He says they didn't publish. Well, he actually says that they didn't write. So they couldn't be philosophers if they didn't publish, right? And so on. Uh, but what I want to emphasize is that his conception of the axial age was this was the time when there was divergence in the basic frames of meaning for whole civilizations and that they uh, uh, were, were not in the sense that Stuart Glennie says correlate developments uh, in the moral revolution. Um, let me say that um, uh, one of the, the most interesting parts of Jean's book uh, deals with Stuart Glennie's idea of the basically scientific and technological developments uh, in the modern age. And what I do find particularly interesting is that while Stuart Glennie had this very optimistic view of that his ultimate philosophy of history uh, was leading to uh, a much better time with modern civilization that he expected to be fully realized by the end of the 20th century, Jean's use of the same concepts is actually rather pessimistic. Uh, and it highlights a lot of the problems that contemporary civilization has, uh, particularly around issues of climate change, due to precisely the science and technology that uh, Stuart Glenny was emphasizing as a hallmark of our modern age. So let me finish on that point. Thank you very much. Thank you, Victor. Uh, let me start with the last point. Yes, I, I, um, I take a different interpretation. I'm, I don't have a happy ending for civilization uh, on the basis of, um, not on the basis of Stuart Glennie's idea of a third age of, what would we call it, uh, scientific humanism. Um, but I do find his overarching philosophy of history interesting in its parts, just as Karl Marx has an interesting philosophy of history you don't need to take the whole thing to find points of it uh, of interest. Uh, I agree with Victor's criticism that Stuart Glennie tends, uh, although mentioning the factors of, of East Asia as part of the moral revolution, he tends to neglect later developments of East Asia. He does, however, uh, make an important distinction that I, I do not think Jaspers makes, and that is in the moral revolution, he claims that East Asia maintained more of what he called Panzoanism than in the West. So I need to say what Panzoanism is. Uh, if you're familiar with the idea of animism, the idea that uh, there's a liveliness of things and a spirit inhabits things, Stuart Glennie developed a, an alternative, a critique of uh, E.B. Tyler's idea of animism, and he argued that aboriginal and early civilizational religious beliefs and outlook 
were panzoanist, that is, the livingness of things, all things living. And <clears throat> so he does see a difference in uh, Eastern philosophies that acknowledge the place of nature more in, their, in this out outlook. Uh, though, again, he doesn't pick up on the later developments. Uh, one question I have with Weber is, um, would Weber, could Weber allow the axial age concept? Because he goes into nuanced, specific studies of the different world religions. Could he allow an overarching concept uh, in Jasper's terms, you know, let alone Stuart Glenny's? Uh, Stuart Glenny is a kind of an opposite in the sense if Weber is giving you a nuanced view of uh, specific world religions, uh, Stuart Glenny is giving us a kind of an abstract, an outline that is more distant from the phenomenon. Um, let me turn to one other point. The idea of uh, th that um, Yastras may be a better model to build on, um, if we accept, and I do, that his, uh, Stuart Glenny's three stages of scientific humanism is overly deterministic. That is, from a Panzoanist period through the moral revolution to a modern scientific humanism. Uh, there's still some things I find interesting. For Stuart Glenny, uh, Panzoanism is the idea of true intuitions of nature clothed in false conceptions. But, as opposed to, say, Comte, who had the first stage of history as fictional, Stuart Glenn is allowing that there's true intuitions of nature, that, that the relationship and the attunement to the environment is picking up laws of nature in some way, maybe clothing them fantastically. And the modern scientific humanism age he saw kicking in around 2000 when he argued that there would be a United States of Europe, well, which there has been, but maybe not for long. Uh, that would be one in which true intuitions of nature in true conceptions. So he saw a connection between the earliest and the latest, and he took the phase of the moral revolution as transitional, as having as its task, so to speak, the differentiation of subjective and objective. And so what I find of interest is um, this model that originates out of nature, spirit, in Jasper's terms, originates out of nature. Jaspers cannot allow that. He makes a distinction between nature and spirit. It diverges, yet in developmentally purposive ways, the differentiation of subjective and objective. And third, it finds a means to realign with nature. Jaspers forbids the continuity of nature and spirit, as does Weber. So if you don't want the whole uh, philosophy of history of Stuart Glenny, there still might be useful aspects of it in the connections with nature. Uh, Mumford and D.H. Lawrence allow nature and spirit and development in history and argue for a reconciliation there. Um, I wonder whether uh, Stuart Glenny's model, what would Bella do with it? I, I talked with Robert Bella, uh, but his book was already published. Um, and he argues for a development of um, cognitive abilities and the theoretic attitude as a way of restating the, the axial age of moral revolution. So I'll leave it with that. Thank you, Jean. So questions, comments? Everyone is welcome. It's just a request for uh, elaboration on the, uh, you know, concept of moral revolution as uh, placed by uh, uh, Stuart uh, Glenny in the con uh, in, uh, in in uh, this continuity of philosoph uh, philosophical history. I mean, his philosophy of history uh, has these three stages, as you just elaborated. Concept of moral revolution. Uh, how does it uh, uh, connect? I mean, the earlier phase with the scientific humanism or this technological civilization, and is uh, moral revolution as it occurred in the middle? Uh, is it sort of spilling over into contemporary era as well? Another name uh, Stuart Glenny used for the outlook of Panzoanism was Naturianism, nat naturalism or Naturianism. And so he, the connection between that first phase and the third phase would be a completion of Naturialism. Science would complete the reconnection of nature. And uh, 
Stuart Glennie argued for, and again, this is it, it does go more to Western developments, of 500-year cycles. And so uh, the first being the, the, the outbreak of the moral revolution in these different areas, China, ancient Greece, India, and uh, ancient Judaism. Then he sees the, a, a dialectic occurring, and again, it's more located for the West, between Greek science as carrying natura, naturalism and Judeo-Christianism as carrying supernaturalism. He sees this as the advent of supernaturalistic religions. Uh, Panzoanism was not a supernatural outlook. It was what nature was. It was an enlarged view of what nature can be. We might think of it as supernatural in contemporary terms, but that's not how he thought of it. And so he saw this phase of a dialectic, a conflict, and every 500 years he, he tries to show how that um, conflict goes on, and he sees in the end science will triumph. It will not end religion, but it will be something like a, a scientific humanism, a religion where one can identify with the cosmos, thankful for the insights of science, something like that. Will it end ethics? No, that ethics would be part of this as well. Religion, poetry, ethics, uh, as scientifically informed, is, is I think would be his outlook. Thank you. Uh, you know, it, it is a happy picture. and In a sense, science did triumph, but not in the happy ways that he saw that it would occur. I think it's important to see that Stuart Glennie's uh, idea of stages, uh, though it differs from Comte's in, and is based on a critique of Comte, still has the notion of three stages and the third most the modern stage to be uh, uh, realized in the 20th century was basically positivism. And it, in that sense, there's a, a closer connection to Comte than in the treatment of the earlier stages, I think. Uh, so uh, the idea is that, yes, there'll still be religion and ethics and so on, but somehow they're largely to be derived from a scientific worldview. If this is the uh, edge of sci scientific humanism, and it is similar to uh, uh, Comte's uh, positivistic edge, the third stage. Uh, the kind of uh, positivism that Comte envisioned, that is at least philosophically dead. And uh, so, I mean, uh, scientific humanism uh, probably uh, could still have a lease uh, on its life. But as far as uh, positivism is concerned, it is dead. So I don't know uh, if scientific humanism can be identified with positivism. I think that uh, Jaspers viewed it as dead. And uh, there's uh, a similarity with Stuart Glennie in that the later parts of the origin and goal of history are dealing with the contemporary 20th century situation and the many ambiguities for Jaspers of how things are developing. But he emphasizes that uh, the axial age and later uh, times should be viewed as uh, particular kinds of processes, but not as stages. And in that sense, uh, there is a quite radical breaking with Comte and I think with Stuart Glennie as well. Now we are hearing a response from Christopher Pitt, Associate Professor in Theoretical Psychology at the King's University and Edmonton, Alberta, Canada. From his initial background in existentialism and phenomenology, Greece has increasingly moved into questions of world history and end of the world anxieties, which seems to me ultimate existential question. And now Chris is working on a book on the practical spiritualities of the axial age. Welcome. Thankful for the gracious of inviting me. It's pretty exciting to be here. I have been working on the actual age for more than a decade. 
um, but mostly in isolation. Um, what one of the things that brings me to it that I enjoy very much, and I can see it in uh, Eugene's book, is that it, it transcends disciplinary alignment. So the fact you have a philosopher and a sociologist, a psychologist here to talk about it, it is one very excellent thing about the thesis. Um, the other thing that brings me to the actual age um, in terms of interest is I am interested primarily in the near future, our contemporary world, and our very scientifically rational, empirically grounded anxieties about the end of the world, as you primarily see ecologically, but also internationally. Um, and so I've come to the actual age and an interest in that to see how uh, it addresses those anxieties and helps make sense of them in terms of, uh, you know, how Yasper's would put it in terms of the structure of world history. Um, and on that point, um, Professor Halt and I are in complete agreement. He ends his book there. I begin mine there. And, and, I, and I think that in terms of critique, I want to emphasize that our agreements largely overshadow our disagreements there. I mean, we have some good disagreements, I think, and hopefully they can sharpen some of that picture um, in terms of um, moving us towards what we do agree on. So let me up, emphasize up front my positive appreciation for Halton's book and overall agreement with much of its argument greatly outweighs my negative criticisms. Um, I consider Halton's book as doing a real service to scholarship, and I perceive it as providing a significant contribution to our understanding of the actual age. This is far more important than the negative criticisms I have. So let me briefly enumerate some of the positives. First, in bringing our attention to John Stuart Glennie, um, Lewis Mumford, and D.H. Lawrence as three significant but either unknown or overlooked predecessors or alternatives to Jaspers in articulating the actual age, Halton is making a major contribution. He's entirely correct that Jaspers' version of the actual age thesis has dominated scholarship um, to date, and that this is ultimately to the detriment of a full treatment of the thesis. Um, secondly, that in presenting Stuart Glennie's theory of the moral revolution, Halton recuperates a fascinating and forgotten viewpoint. I certainly had never heard of it. Um, it's worthy in its own right, as well as worthwhile in providing an important corrective to Jasper's claim to be the first systematic proposer of the thesis. Right? He just isn't. Um, it appears that Stuart Glennie is. Numerous predecessors, but no, only one systematic treatment prior to Jasper's. Thirdly, in linking Stuart Glennie's argument for panzoanism to contemporary scholarship in hominid evolution and human prehistory, Halton considerably addresses one of the major lacuna in actual age scholarship, which is namely to provide a better and more nuanced appreciation of the importance and diversity of pre-actual cultures. Now in doing this, Halton rejoins the evolutionary considerations that were raised by Robert Bella in his lengthy 2011 final opus, Religion in Human Evol Evolution, but I suspect that it's actually a more original and more insightful premise than Bella's Jasper-centric perspective. Um, fourth, the concluding chapter uh, makes clear that Halton's interest is not exclusively to further scholarship, although he does so, but that like all actual age theorists, the scholarship is not restricted to any particular discipline, and this transdisciplinary premise aims for the really pressing task in our lifetime, which is to address the crisis of our contemporary world. And to quote Halton on this, for humanity to come to terms with itself as a neotenous primate requiring self-controlling, sustainable limits to civilization at all levels of institutions and beliefs toward the purpose of a sustainable, proliferating planet of life, end quote. I'm in full agreement on that. Um, and now I will move to the negative criticisms, but ultimately it's in the hope of how can we best address that pressing task. I have, just like I had four positives, I have four negatives. They all share a one feature. They push back on the notion that Jaspers overvalued the importance of the actual age. That's Halton's claim. Uh, these criticisms center on the book's final pages, pages 124 to 126, where Halton lays out the central consequences of his appeal to Stuart Glennie and company. Halton calls on the potential of our two million year long term evolutionary legacy, the depths of our Pleistocene Panzonist legacy, as deeply embedded resources that will provide us with the means to counter and subordinate our more recent history. The more recent history is a contraction of the fullness of life that the hunter gatherer lived into an anthropocentric and then mechanicocentric um, view. My criticism of this is just how is this evolutionary legacy effectively present, either actively or as potential in our lives and bodies today? Descriptively, it's accurate that it's our legacy. How is it actively present? In what way is this past as a resource embodied within us? What means or mechanisms to bring it out into effective consciousness? Ironically, it seems to me that it is precisely the distinctively evolved human characteristic of prolonged neoteny, which Halton discusses and uses at length, 
that displaces the power of the environment from having the kind of a constitutive necessity that Halton ascribes to it. Is Halton overvaluing this evolutionary heritage? Second criticism, Halton claims he is not invoking some nostalgic idea of a na naive noble savage, nor that people should nostalgically revert to hunter-gatherer ways. Nevertheless, I do read Halton as falsely idealizing the hunter-gatherer in two respects. So these are my second and third criticisms. First, in terms of, this is from the point of view of actual ethics, Halton ascribes to the hunter-gatherer the panzoanist revering of all life. This is incorrect because there was one form of life they did not revere or respect, that of the life of other humans, other tribes. Hunter-gatherer groups or tribes did not ha live with nonviolent reverence for the other groups. Like Karen Armstrong in 2006, I concur that the actual ethic is one of universal compassion to all life, most overtly emphasizing all human life, but love of one's neighbor, as one way of summarizing that, regardless of ethnicity or tribal identity, is arguably the actual ideal. And it's most pointedly contrary to the evolutionary heritage we see in our social psychology of us versus them, in-group versus out-group, stereotyping, prejudice, racism, violence, all of that stuff. Right? I am invoking an evolutionary past here as actively at work in our social psychology. Um, it seems clearly and obviously enacted, and I think Halton, in his strong critique of the anthropocentric emphasis of the actual age as a fallacy, fallacy overlooks that the positive side of the anthropocentric focus of the actual age is a universalist, non-violent ethics that pre-actual societies, in any form, seem to entirely lack. I think for a sustainability revolution to be achieved, we have to have non-violence. Second part, so my third criticism of idealizing it, is how to read the emer significance of the emergence of civilization. This emergence of civilization is not chosen, it's evolved. Just as those hunter-gatherers at the peripheries of the centers and beyond did not choose to remain hunter-gatherer. If this is so, then it is precisely in the response to civilization by those who lived within it, that is, the revolutionary visions of transcendence as critique of civilizational practices um, formed by the actual age, that should be of more relevance to the contemporary world. Um, and would not the practices of pre-actual societies prove inapplicable to civilization, even more so to contemporary civilization, insofar as they lack proper appreciation of the scale and dynamics ushered in by civilization? Fourthly and finally, it seems to me Jasper's claim about the structure of world history is descriptively accurate um, in terms of the mid-first millennium BC, as Stuart Glennie also argues. In terms of systems of thought and belief, there is a dividing line between a great diversity before and an after in which a mere several ever-growing systems amalgamate others and reduce that diversity. These several systems, Confucianism, Buddhism, Hinduism, Greek thinking, ethical monotheism of Judaism, Christianity, Islam, trace their origins to Greece, Israel, India, China. But now the key point. One minute. My key point in one minute. Jasper's claims, right, so descriptively that's the structure of world history for Jasper's, but Jasper's also claims the actual age ended in failure. History went on, which does not sound like an overvaluing. As in, the actual age breakthrough should not be mistaken as somehow causally responsible for the rest of that history. Briefly, what I sort of argue is that actual age visions fail. They kind of hitch onto that trajectory of history. They inform it. They, they instill a critical element in the history of all of those civilizations. But viewed from a long arc of the evolutionary into history trajectory, um, history just continues. Um, and we don't become you know, universally nonviolent or loving our neighbor, etc. Um, relative to what those visionaries wanted to accomplish, which is a radical rejection of civilizational power, um, they hitch on to that trajectory, they fail to significantly change it. Success would have meant a redirecting of that civilizational arc, uh, which we still need to do now, and success would have meant um, an argument against that deep anthropocentrism, which um, Halton is rightly critical of. I think in focusing on the actual age as failure, there might prove more in common between those actual visions and the animate mind than Halton might realize. One possible exception to this last claim I find in his book is Halton's own recognition, page 124, that Buddhist mindfulness and Taoist nature practices are, quote, ways of being deeply aware in the present. It is not clear to me, however, why he would not extend this to the full range of actual spiritual practices, whether Confucian disciplines of self-cultivation, Hindu yoga, Old Testament prophets training for ecstasy, or for that matter, crying in the wilderness, or the Greek um, philosophy which Pierre Hadot has shown
to be exercises of contempla contemplation that bear a strong resemblance to all of those others. In this respect, it seems to me that the failed actual age visions have more to say to we inheritors of civilization and to our present world crises than our hunter-gatherer ancestors do. Thank you. Thank you very much. On Chris's last point, I, I would agree. I, I think given the state of the world today, we need everything we can get to throw at it, uh, actual spiritual practices included. Um, a, a number of uh, Chris's criticisms uh, go to my role in the book with my ideas. I didn't mention that earlier. I, saw, I also take a perspective in this book. Uh, but I didn't want to take up too much space in the book, so there's maybe some of the information is missing that is part of the criticism. I propose uh, my own philosophy of history briefly in the last chapter, not as progress, but as a progress in precision counteracted by a regress of mind. And I see history as a contraction of mind. So the outer circle, if you can allow yourself to imagine, the outer circle, which was suggested to me by biologist Lynn Margulis, is animate earth. A, a circle within that is animate mind. That animate mind is the mind that we evolved into these anatomically modern bodies attuned to the greater animate earth and its sustaining powers. and intelligence, instinctive intelligence. With the development of civilization, the advent of civilization, we radically alter our two million year trajectory and I call that anthropocentric mind. With the modern era, we contract again. So we begin to take humans as our role models rather than wild nature, our great teachers of the animals and plants and all of that. We start to take other uh, the unmatured or uh, uh, neotenous creatures as our role models. What does it mean when you learn from a squirrel how to build a waterproof shelter? That's true instinct, that's brilliant, genius. What does it mean if you take as your role models creatures that, um, whose plasticity allows us freedom but also allows us to be not just greater rational creatures than the rest of animal kind but greater irrational creatures than the rest of animal kind. And so let me go to what I see as powerful in the idea of panzoanism, uh, as Stuart Glennie puts it, or in my own work, what is this legacy? I think you've put it, uh, in what way does this heritage affect, is it effectively active today? Human neotenous plasticity evolved attuned to a greater wild intelligence in reverential and practical learning relationships. Religions are always two sides of a coin, reverential and practical. Uh, played out in ritual and practical relations in clan-based foragers. Though attuning to ecological mind, we humans, through attuning to ecological minds, we could find our maturity as relatively unmatured or neotenous creatures. When we began to elevate other neotenous, relatively unmatured apes exclusively as our role models, eventually selecting exemplars of them as representing the ultimate, as divine, we tuned into mirrors of human unmaturity, in my view. This past, where is it? It's in our human genome. Human nature involves a complex, nuanced, innate sociality, bodying forth in communicative musicality, as neuroscientists Colin Trevarthen and Stephen Malik called it, a banter between infants and their mothers. Uh, this inborn social musical capacity is dialogical and expressive, the pulse rhythm quality of music, and you can understand how the mother might tune into that, but the baby is doing that from the subcortical brain. This is wired into us. It's where nature nurture goes on. The nature of the infant brings to bear the, the mothering, and out of that comes eventually a bantering that will turn into linguistic language. There are optimums of how to parent infants and children, that when you look at the practices of many hunter-gatherers, they know how to do that. The close tactile connection, the gaze, uh, the focus, and the freedom allowed to the developing child are legacies that get altered. For example, consider the Puritan idea of innate depravity, that children are born evil. As Jonathan Edwards put it, a child, uh, a child of the devil, a viper. Augustine, a baby's limbs earlier, Augustine, are feeble as it kicks and strikes out, but its mind is sinful. 
This is an alienated outlook which has falsely separated from human nature, then declared that separation to be human nature. One might call this outlook which vilifies the newborn original sin. Would a mother ever come up with such a depraved view of newborns? So I think there's great wisdom to be found in parenting practices that tune in to the two million years in which they developed. Two million years in which we have found that children have expectations that can be optimally met or thwarted. So I think I'm out of time, but uh, I can't go to the other points here, but maybe they'll come up in other. I would like to know, thank you very much for your insight. Uh, I have understood Jaspers, the actual age, as a, a representation away from the historical also as a human sense of a journey that we're traveling, that it dawned in all different parts of the world, that we were here on a journey from darkness into light, from bondage to freedom. And that the end, in some sense, in our present age is that we have lost this sense of life as a journey. And that is kind of a failure, maybe where Jaspers would say, the end has come uh, because that, that ultimate light that was beckoning us has disappeared. We're just now in the present and maybe it's dark. Uh, so I would like to know what your vision is. Is this away from the historical, I understand that your other person, Gen Genius, that's his name, I've never heard of him, uh, more talks in historical terms of periods in our history, but is not so much talking about a more, uh, and I don't want to use religion, but more or a, a belief into a better time to come in our, in our uh, journey. Carl Jaspers addresses something Stuart Glennie could not. Stuart Glennie's happy ending optimism could not address the problems of our time. Carl Jaspers direct, directly addressed them. Lewis Mumford directly addressed them. These are the two social theorists, philosophers, who were the first to write about the atomic bomb right after the conclusion of World War II. And they each came to see the dangers uh, when Pandora's box of technology, science and technology, are released and uncontrollable. And so um, I, think, I think you put Mumford into the mix with Jaspers. There's two, two um, outlooks that are highly critical of our time and that suggest an altern alternatives. For Jaspers, if I'm, maybe my, my uh, fellow panelists would have another view, I don't know, but it's, there, we could have a second axial age. We need to bring those values back against these overwhelming forces. For Mumford, organic humanism that can tap the past, the filaments of history, prehistory, they never die, they stay with us uh, and are valuable resources. D.H. Lawrence took the most tragic view of these people. He saw this period of 600, 500, 600 BCE as a cleaving from cosmos, as the elevation of mind, of the negating and critical consciousness that should be secondary becoming primary. He all offered an alternative, affirming, affirmative mind, the primary way of consciousness, he said that stays with us. For me, that is the primary way of consciousness that is our long-term legacy that we can bring into practice today through parenting practices, through diet, through different kinds of awareness of the habitat, uh, of reconnecting with nature. My question is that you, you mentioned, for instance, the sort of interdisciplinary use, utility of the axial age, and also your own sort of kind of endorsement of, of the concept. And so I'd just like to ask you, I mean, how do you, how would you respond or how do you respond to the standard critiques of the axial age concept that it's not like a real, that it can't be used as like a real historical periodization, that it's just too capacious, that you can't really say, okay, in, you know, real human time, and you know, 600 BC to 200 BC something, happen that it's really, you know, if, if it's anything, it's just a conceptual category. Um, it's, uh, such critiques are, are, are pretty common, and I guess do you, 
do you have a response to them? Do you deal with them at all? And if you don't in your book, how would you, you know, how would you think about those, uh, those ideas? Thank you. If you take the line of the religions of the book, Judaism, Christianity, uh, the Muslim religion, uh, 4.2 billion, 4.2 or 4.4 billion humans on the earth are believers in that, primarily Christian and Muslim. That's a legacy from that era that is predominant on the earth today. The majority of humans on the earth are believing in those beliefs. Uh, that to me would be one powerful, and that's just, a, you know, and that's just part of the, that picture. Uh, the ways in which um, developments that come out of that era still stay with us uh, seems to me to be one way of answering. To borrow a phrase from Halton's book, um, there's a critique of how there's a move from anthropocentrism that civilization creates and the actual age entrenches, and then it moves in the last few centuries to mechanicocentrism. Um, well, I, I see a lot of the university, the academy, in being divided up into all of these disciplines as a, a yet further contraction, and that it's like looking so close at a painting that all you can see are the paint smudges, but you can't really say what the painting's about. So I think it's, there's no, no reason not to take a number of steps back and say, oh, this is actually a picture of uh, a man on a horse. It's not just white splotches and green splotches. So I would just reject those criticisms, and I would say that the, the true task of an intellectual is not to be an adherent to some particular academic discipline for the sake of a career, but is to address the world's problems. And if you take you know, a, a demographic look um, as, uh, Eugene just mentioned, um, beyond just Christianity, Islam, and Hinduism, at, at what could be rooted in the actual age, my estimate is between 80 and 95 percent of the world loosely adheres to ways of thinking that were developed during the actual age. So am I deeply committed to it, therefore, as like true and real and factual? I'm not a Karl Popper fan. But I think ideally this thesis, as we get more and more research on it and we get more, like certainly we need to know about, more about Persia, Zoroastrianism, the Achaemenid Empire, etc. Ideally it would eventually falsify itself. But if in the meantime it's fruitful and it helps us to grasp what's going on, and above all the notion that you look back and you see a dividing line, that's what he means by axis in history, and, and there was sort of a crisis time that people were responding to, is that relevant for us today? Are we in a crisis time and do we need to respond to it? I think so. I don't know if we're in a second actual age. A lot of theorists are interested in that question, as am I. Um, but certainly there, there's enough parallels there that it's worth pursuing. I mean, what Jaspers does emphasize is that uh, the philosophic developments in each of the axial uh, civilizations led to a feeling about the terror of life in a way that had not been experienced before. There was a formation of uh, transcendental ideals against which all human life uh, fails to measure up and uh, leads us to uh, judge critically, very harshly, uh, perhaps judging the sense of terror that we have to live with by awareness of shortcomings that was not true of any of the prior civilizations. Now, that this happened in over a period of several hundred years after uh, several thousand years of human society plus another uh, several uh, tens of thousands of years of uh, prehistoric uh, experience that we really don't have any accurate record of seems to me of, of a reasonable way to think of, of a demarcation in civilization uh, where what has happened since uh, in the major civilizations is different from the way life was experienced before. Uh, however, the concept of axial age that uh, tries to generalize across them is perhaps arbitrary. Uh, you know, what's most important is to understand the developments in each of those civilizations, uh, whether we put great weight on the 
uh, relative similar timing is another matter, I think. And now we are moving to our last presentation. And the critique is Ben, who is from University of Virginia, but also his academic activity related to Europe, Netherlands, and Ben already finished, I guess, very important book on the subject. So, Mike is yours. Uh, I think it, it goes without saying that Eugene Halton has made an important contribution to the discourse on the Axial Age. We wouldn't be here having this panel if that was not the case. Um, so given that the, the title of this um, session is Author Meets Critics, instead of enumerating all of the many ways in which this is a worthy book, I will just say it is a worthy book and you should read it. But I'm also meant to be a critic here, so now I'll sort of focus on offering some of my criticisms. Um, the first thing that I wanted to say is that I think with regards to his, his basic argument that Stuart Glenny articulated a, a robust concept of the concept that we describe as the Axial Age, some 75 years before Jaspers, it's undoubtedly true. Now here's the, the next question. Should we now use the concept that Stuart Glenny advanced, that of the Moral Revolution, instead of the Axial Age? Should we rename the Axial Age the Moral Revolution? I think this is one of the arguments that, that's made throughout the book. Um, and I think it's made at three different levels. The first level is in terms of what we might call the ethics of scientific terminology. Um, the second level is made in terms of explanatory power. And the third argument is made at the level of sort of underlying philosophy of history, the sort of robustness of the broader philosophy of history suggested by the concept. Um, so let's kind of briefly look at the arguments that are presented on each of those levels. So one, the ethics of scientific terminology. The argument is made that because Stuart Glenny put this concept forward before Jaspers, that somehow should incline us to use that term instead of Jaspers' own term. And so I'll quote, he says, uh, Eugene says, there is an accepted ethics of terminology that an original theory should be credited to its originator, and the originator of the theory I am discussing clearly precedes Jaspers. So we should give credit to him, but then also the question is, should we give naming power to him, and he quotes here Charles Peirce, a famous pragmatist philosopher. The author of a scientific conception has the first right to name it, and his name ought to be accepted unless there are grave substantial objections to it. So I think one assumption here is that the moral revolution and the axial age are, are scientific concepts. Um, and I, I say scientific concepts, I think one of the ways that Peirce might be thinking about this is imagine we're speaking about a subatomic particle and a concept of it was discovered to have been advanced by some German thinker, you know, I don't know, before Higgs and, and his colleagues came up with it. So we rename it when we discover it. But that assumes that it's the same concept, it's within the same theoretical framework, and that sort of to name it or to not name it is more of a sort of a secondary matter because the nature of the concept is clear. It's within a paradig paradigmatic program of scientific research. But I think what we're talking about with concepts such as the Axial Age and the Moral Revolution, it's not sort of normal science. It's not paradigmatic uh, research. It's philosophical history. It's social theory. It's actually searching for new ways of thinking about confusing uh, phenomena. Um, so I think the fact that two concepts are put forward in this, con in this context, the earlier one doesn't get the right to um, sort of went out over the others. I think in this sort of moment of transitional thought, such as we're, we're finding here, also in fields that are very much not trying to be uh, sort of scientific in the classical sense, um, it, it doesn't work. And I think, for example, you think of the notions, all the ideas that have been put forward surrounding sort of the more worldly oriented religion or spirituality of tribal peoples. We have fetishism, we have animism, we have panzoanism, we have totemism. I mean, the list can, can be multiplied. So based on the argument, should we then go to the first of those concepts? And that's the concept we should employ. Or should we look for the best of those concepts? Um, and I think, for example, within Eugene's own argument, he tries to go for the best of those concepts. He thinks panzoanism is better than animism, even though it came, came later. So the question then is, just because moral revolution came earlier doesn't mean we should employ it. The question is, is it better than the Axial Age? 
So that then takes me to the second point. Is the moral revolution an explanatorily superior concept to that of the axial age? So there's one way in which the moral revolution is clearly superior to the axial age. Um, it doesn't suggest an exclusivity to radical periods of social spiritual transformation. Um, the axial age can very easily suggest that there was sort of one period that really mattered in the history of the human race, the period of 800 to 200 BCE, and everything else wasn't really axial, it wasn't really central. Um, the moral revolution suggests, well, there could be many revolutions, and this was one socio-spiritual revolution that, that took place, and its central premise or its central contribution was the emergence of, of morality. Um, so I think I can make a few points here. The first is that I don't think the term moral revolution is even very accurate to describe the theory of the moral revolution that Stuart Glennie puts forth. Um, so Stuart Glennie talks about three facets of this moral revolution. Um, one of them is this intellectual revolution, which is the emergence of philosophy and literary traditions. The second is a religious revolution, which is sort of revolts against old religions, the emergence of um, uh, sort of speculation, more universally uh, oriented religions. Um, and then the, the third is uh, religions about purification and conscience. And then the third is a socio-political transformation, that the emergence of kind of vast empires, even a world empire, of sort of ideals of universal brotherhood, and also republicanism. So if the moral revolution is the right concept, it should somehow explain what holds all of those revolutions together as facets of one common whole. And is morality that core feature? It doesn't seem to me that that, that is a good argument. Um, I think that, for example, if you think of the emergence of world empires, it doesn't seem like morality is at the core. That's not the key principle. There's something else taking place. The Achaemenid Empire, it's not about a world, uh, a moral revolution. Um, also, I don't think that, for example, Greek natural philosophy is a kind of a moral revolution. Now, again, I think moral, sort of the emergence of kind of ethical and moral ideals that, that guide humanity in a new way, it's part of that process, but I, I, I still don't think that that's even the best description for the insights Stuart Glennie has. Um, so, and I think also, for example, when um, Eugene later in his book starts talking about this period and critiquing it, he himself doesn't emphasize the moral dimension of the period in question. It's the theoretic dimension that, that he's more critical of. And this is the concept that Robert Bella de uh, deploys to describe this period as a kind of theoretic revolution, the emergence of a more kind of conceptual, abstract, rationally self-reflexive culture. So in a way, it seems that you know, even Halton himself, in the way he talks about it, uses and emphasizes the theoretic dimension more than he does the, the moral dimension. Um, so again, that's not to say that there couldn't be a better term than the axial age. I just don't think that moral revolution is really the right term. Um, the second is I think there's something about the term axial that, that has a power. Sort of it, it, its vagueness in a way. It, it suggests a, a, a fundamental turn without specifying the nature of that turn. It, it leaves open inquiry. It's not a theory of what characterized this transformation from the period of 800 to 200 BCE, but it's an orienting generalization in a way. And I think one of the reasons that the subsequent discussion on the Axial Age has been so productive has been that the very terminology Jaspers employed invited further contribution as opposed to staking a claim about here's my theory and you either take it or leave it with a concept. You could use the term Axial Age and not feel sort of bound to Jaspers' own articulation. But with something like the moral revolution, well, if I didn't believe that the, the kind of core of that period was a moral revolution, then I would have to sort of debate the terminology before I could begin my arguments and my inquiry. And then it would lead to a certain fragmentation of, well, oh, he's about the moral revolution, he's about the theoretic revolution, he's about the kind of imperial revolution, the transcendent revolution. But in a way, the term axial lets us all be part of the same conversation in a way that I think is very productive. Um, and I think one way you could sort of deal with that is uh, John Torpy um, sort of talks about multiple periods of axiality or, or multiple axial ages. Now, he wants to say, well, the nature of this particular axial age was a moral revolution. I would disagree with that. But nevertheless, I think to speak about kind of axiality or moments of axial change, 
to me is a, is a productive way of moving forward. Um, so then the last point, and I don't think I have time to fully engage in it, is sort of these contending philosophies of history. And I think part of the reason that, that, um, that Halton wants to sort of emphasize the use of, of Stuart Glenny's term is that he thinks that somehow the Stuart Glenny's insight into Panzoanism is, is more powerful than Jasper's insight into kind of these axial religious metaphysical movements. Which is to say there, there's, a con there's a similar structure in, in Halton and Jasper's argument. Jasper's looks to the axial age as sort of a saving force in the world today. It's not to say that we have to go back to it, but somehow we have to creatively renew the sources that generated it in the first place. And that's somehow what he holds before us as the solution to the problems of the world. And I think in a similar way, Halton looks back to this sort of early tribal period, if we can even say that, the Panzoanistic period, and holds that as sort of the saving power, that we need to look back to this period, creatively renew and revitalize the insights and the forces that were present, and that's actually how we can solve the problems of the world. But then in a way, there's sort of a common one-sidedness, and I find myself agreeing with both Jaspers and with Halton as well. But in the fact that I agree with them both, I sort of agree with neither of them, that there's one solution, there's one sort of origin point that if we could revitalize that, that's how we could solve the problems of the modern world. And then I think in a way, Lewis Mumford, who is a figure that I, I am personally indebted uh, to Halton for, for introducing me to, brought a slightly different perspective. Um, and I get the sense that in your, your kind of language now, um, you're sort of speaking more in this term, this, these terms, but that he sort of saw every period as containing certain insights that needed to be preserved, but also certain imbalances that need to be overcome. And in that regard, I would say I'm, I'm completely in accord with, with uh, Mumford's view. I think this kind of early tribal period of human society had certain powerful insights that we need to kind of preserve, creatively renew, but also big imbalances that need to be left behind. I think you could look at the period of early civilization with the same perspective. You think you could look at the axial age with the same perspective. I think you could look at the modern technical revolutions in the same way as well. So all that would be that I, I would uh, sort of at least in the rhetoric that I've encountered in the last chapter of the book, would also personally prefer a perspective that looked to the insights and limitations of each period without sort of presenting one as the kind of the, the origin point for the, the powers that could solve the problems of the modern world. And I think that Jaspers himself also kind of, that would be a critique that I would agree uh, with Halton in leveling at him. Um, so thank you very much. William Blake said that if religion were morality, Socrates would be the savior. Last night, I heard the presidential address by Kwang Loi uh, Shun on the idea of no self, uh, discussing Confucius and Mencius. And throughout the entire lecture was the words morality, ethics, reflection. Um, but morality, moral presence, moral uh, detachment came through. So on the, on the, on the side of um, intellectual development, I think there's a clear case to be made. The, the major outbreaks of philosophy in China and Greece uh, contained, certainly in so, a figure as, such as Socrates um, and Plato. Uh, religion, I think you can make a good case for religion becomes moral. <laughs> you know, it's kind of odd to our ears to hear that today, but religion was many things. You know, there are no more temple prostitutes after religion becomes moral. moral morality becomes a central focus. Um, in the intellectual side, I, um, uh, Ben did not mention, I don't think now, but in his comments, uh, he does present a case of what do you, what do, you do with Greek science? Do you call that moral? That's, I think that's a problem. I, I don't think that fits neatly. Uh, but then the third dimension that uh, Stuart Glenny would talk about, the, the intellectual, the religious, and the social, something like the outbreak of Athenian democracy is about the morality of the commonality, of the common life. Uh, the uh, Achaemenid Empire was noted for increasing religious tolerance. Um, even though it's an empire, you don't think of that as you know, good morality, they, they, it also did that. So I think there's a strong case to be made for uh, 
uh, the moral revolution in that sense. And, and Stuart Glennie also used another term for the legacy from that time to the present. He called it the modern revolution, which is a whole other interesting uh, way to take off on that. One of my problems with the axial age uh, as, a, as a term for this phenomena is it makes the claim that that's the pivot of all history. And it's not the most important pivot of history, in my view. Uh, 4.2 or 4 billion people believe in uh, the legacy of the axial age, of the moral revolution. What percentage of them eat axial or moral revolution? They don't. They eat Neolithic. The advent of agriculture and its formation into civilization was a radical change of direction. From two million years of sustaining life, we went into a situation where people got shorter, nastier, and more brutish. Literally shorter, 10 to 15 centimeters, four to six inches, on average, not only in Egypt, Mesopotamia, India, but in the New World, because it was a systemic property of a reduction of diet from a wide variety of the Garden of Eden where you're foraging and it gets thin, you move to the next place, to settled agriculture. Uh, hierarchy radically increases. The invention of warfare as a systematic killing genocidal practice, that's civilized. We, cap we captured plants and animals and put them in, to, you know, bent their genomes toward the human interest. And then we started doing that with people as well. Uh, the increase of uh, a number of things, to me, that would be, if you wanted to have an axis, that would be the prime axis. So I do have a problem with uh, the term axial as the pivot of all history. And so the moral revolution may not be the ultimate term. I don't think that it's going to replace the axial age, but I do think it's good to have them out there, uh, to allow the, pre the, the, the first developed theory that Stuart Glenny had its place. Uh, I use them both, uh, the moral revolution slash axial age. Uh, it doesn't, I'm not trying to take away from uh, Jasper's contribution, but I just think a dialectic like we're having now, moral revolution or axial age, in itself raises many of these issues. Thank you very much. To the extent anyone would like to respond, I wonder what your reaction would be to the following kind of uh, theory or observation, that part of what's meant by the axial age is a kind of very significant turn toward interiority, the building up of uh, an inward journey, but over and beyond that, uh, a kind of sense that there's an appearance-reality distinction, and the reality beyond appearance is some kind of basis from which evaluations are made of appearance, and interiority is itself guided or judged. Now, I have one other observation about that. If there's some truth to the interiority thesis, I think there's something very frightening almost to say about the development of technology. Um, and I'll mention it in relation to something very timely. It was a very engaging uh, set of remarks made by Patrick Byrne, one o'clock today in uh, the Grant Hotel, uh, where he was talking about the extent to which automation would uh, just increase exponentially. Now, one way to look about the exponential uh, increase of automation is that's going to create more and more joblessness. Uh, but there's another way to look at it that's not socioeconomic, and that uh, is that galloping uh, technology and automation, won't that have considerable effects on the uh, further inculcation and the cultivation of inwardness? or the interior journey. So basically my point is, uh, or the suggestion I have, or my desire is that I'd love to hear a few more marks about your views on the pivotal or non-pivotal or the significant uh, aspects of interiority with respect to the axial. As, as you may have picked up from, from my remarks, I think there is something powerful about the term axial and about allowing that term to be sort of to not go too much further into trying to kind of make it more concrete. And I think the reason that it's so powerful is because it orients us to something without closing down the possibilities. Um, 
And I think, for example, with Jasper, and you talk about, you look at what he says about the axial age. He says, the more and more you look at this kind of phenomena of the parallelism of the axial age, the more mysterious it becomes. And I think for him, that, that, that element of cultivating sort of an, uh, a, a sort of vibrant sense, not just of mystery in the kind of romantic sense, but that where there is unknowability, and that to attune ourselves to unknowability is actually the source of continued insight and continued understanding and advancement. And I think he did the same thing very much with the kind of early tribal society. I think maybe he went too far, but just to say we, we really don't know what happened when human beings emerged. And let's not confuse ourselves by thinking that our models really are telling us what's happening. So I think in, in that regard, Inwardness is, is one interesting way of kind of spinning the axial age and looking at it. But then I think if you spin it too far, then you sort of set things up and it's like, well, we had inwardness, we lost inwardness, now we need more inwardness. And then it's like a, a neat solution to, to kind of the problems of the modern world. You say, oh, it was sort of reflexiveness and we had it and then we lost it, now we need it back, you know? And I, I guess to me, part of the power of what the axial age was is there was like, uh, an act of transcendence, let's say, which is to say things entered into history which hadn't been foreseen. Um, and I think that sort of recognition of the, the sheer sort of radicality of the moment and the acceptance that such radical moments of discontinuity are part of human history, to me it also, that is itself, it sort of stimulates thought, it opens up possibilities. Maybe technology goes in a certain direction and then who knows what happens? Who knows what social movement emerges? Who knows what thinker or kind of prophet or figure or counteractive movement or collapse? And again, it's not to sort of decry social prediction, but I guess it seems to me that like Jaspers was so hesitant to kind of specify what the future would be and, and how we can then solve those problems. And his solution was very much to kind of cultivate the sense of possibility and that believing that somehow that cultivation could make us responsive to whatever solutions may emerge in the kind of in, in the future. So it's a very long way of kind of just saying, I might ask a different question um, and, and not be about inwardness or rationality or faith or I don't know what, all the different ways we could talk about it, even sort of, you know, the panzoanistic orientation, uh, sort of harmony with nature. To me, those are all going to be facets of something, but that something itself is, is remains a mystery, and I think there's something productive about that. It seems to me that there's one danger in the use of the axial age, and that is to um, project that an oversimplified view of people who lived before the axial age. Uh, many years ago, there was a book by I think the author was Paul Radin, called Primitive Man as Philosopher. Uh, I think if you read the book, as I recall it, as many years since I've read it, it, it's not persuasive philosophy, but there was some reflectiveness uh, in the people he had interviewed. And I think um, uh, one risk of Bob Bella's use of uh, psychology in his great book uh, is similarly an assumption that before the axial age, somehow people's thought was, uh, as individuals, much more limited kind of thought. But with um, Jasper's use of the axial age, I've always thought it's a pun. That on the one hand, it's referring to a turning point in history which was actually multiple turning points because he emphasizes it was process, not a stage. And the second was that in each of these civilizations, there was an opening up of the axes of philosophy, of religio philosophy, of thought, in a way that deepened people's reflective capacity. So it was a new, a new inwardness, I would, would agree, that there was an interiority of thought that wasn't possible before. Uh, at the same time, it's exterior, it's because it's shared. Uh, and we count upon one another to have certain frames of thought. Uh, and uh, 
though we may think more deeply and interiorly as individuals, we also have some expectation that one another uh, orients uh, uh, each of ourselves in a similar way. I like the question very much. Um, to repeat, maybe from a slightly different view, some of the points made, I, I really like Ben's point about the actual as it doesn't really specify. I mean, and Jaspers tends to present it that way. He, he gives like a long list of things. And, and if you want to get more academic about it, you could say, well, is he following Max Weber and sort of proposing axiality as a kind of ideal type? I don't think he is. I, I mean, for myself, I find what seems to work best is the Wittgenstein's notion of family resemblance, that you know, Greeks are not exactly the same as Judea, ancient Israel, not exactly the same as ancient India. But there's a family resemblance across those civilizations that Jaspers pulls out. He calls it a spiritualization of consciousness, which would include the moralizing, like in a good way, moralizing that uh, Eugene mentioned would include all those different aspects. And, and I think here, and I'm being postmodern, I have no interest in the essence of the actual age. I like the family resemblance, and which, which feature might you pick and, and emphasize and why? I think there might be some strategicness in doing that, and I think whichever one you pick, for example, I like inwardness very much, I meditate, I, I, think, I think that is, in my view, the cardinal contribution of the actual age, which is like a, a discovery or an invention of techniques and spiritual practices that develop and cultivate inwardness that weren't really there before. It's not that they didn't think, but they thought differently. At the very same time, as soon as I do that, I should also be critically aware there might be a real danger in doing that. Like inwardness can become like this endless fantasy or pathology or like there's a real danger with that at the same time. Um, why might I emphasize that today? Well, just like Jaspers is deeply worried about the age of technology, that's his primary concern, and this is before social media. You know, I as a professor who see all of these young adults hooked into social media, I mean, virtuality is the opposite of inwardness. I mean, I think we need contemplative practices or meditative practices in, in order to develop and strengthen our inner life, partly as a form of resistance to social media. The way I think during the actual age it was developed was as a form of resistance to the overwhelming power of civilization. Um, a lot of actual age theorists kind of have a general theory that it just sort of happens at that time. I don't know, social, what, social unrest? Is that one of the terms that gets used? I think it's more pointed than that. I think the visionaries of the actual age are very specifically targeting civilizational power and, and it's become too big. The scale is too large and we, in, in, in human being becoming too large, we lose a proper relationship to ourselves, our inner lives, to others, and to nature. Um, I do think there is a, an ecological imperative, but it's fairly subtle and it's fairly hidden. There's no doubt their primary focus is other people and is anthropocentric, but I don't think it irrelevant that all of these practitioners of inwardness, th they leave the cities, they, they leave the empires, they go to the forest, they go to the mountain, they go to the cave, they go to the desert. Um, why don't they just return to hunter-gatherer? Why don't they just go out into the wilderness? I mean, I think some do. Morris Berman talks about this as sort of the nomadic option as, as a way of reject, rejecting civilization. But I think for the most part, it's just not an option. You can't go back to Paul Shepard's sacred game and hunt in the way you used to because human population is growing, human power is growing, civilizations are growing, and they're going to conquer and wipe out the hunter-gatherers they meet. So where are we going to find spiritual goodness to counter that? I think the notion that you find it inwardly is, is a, is, makes a lot of sense and is very good. Now, we can't just stop there. That contemplation has to transform into action, which is what I think the visionaries wanted. And they do go on to found world religions, um, which don't fully realize their visions at all. Often they fail as they get institutionalized. But I do think that's like a noble resource that is still available to us today in a way that I don't think the Panzoanism is as available, but you know, Eugene and I are going to argue about this more. Picking up from uh, an earlier point that Chris was making here, um, the interiority, I think, is one of the commonalities of the different theorists of the Axial Age, the Moral Revolution. Stuart Glennie brings out of qualities of reflectiveness. Uh, he talks about the development of lyric poetry of uh, individual authorship. There's, there's more subjective and, and interiority there. Jaspers certainly addresses that. Lewis Mumford addresses that. And clearly, this was a counterpunch to centralized power. 
of civilization, to the centralized power of the state religion, to the, the king, the invention of alpha male royal kingship. That's, that's a hallmark of civilization, and this is a, an attempt to uh, come against it. I don't think that these kind of developments were invented then. I think they were reinvented because when you look at aboriginal practices, there are vast ways of interiority, of meditative quietness. You try to hunt big game or hunt little game with big game out hunting you, you'll, you'll learn what meditative quietness is, stillness, being in the eternal now quite quickly or it won't matter. And I have practiced uh, uh, from studying with uh, um, a tracker and naturalist who has been schooled in some very deep practices. And I can tell you, it involves different states, subtle states of subconsciousness of almost like a living dream, a waking dream awareness that are completely of a piece with the meditative practices we associate with the moral revolution, the axial age. Um, and so I think there's, there's a kind of part of what I see happened at that time, that counterpunch, was the calling out of stuff that had been there that we want to bring in. Not that it's not in new form as well. When we move toward the modern era, uh, uh, Victor had, uh, I don't think he mentioned it tonight, but one of his criticisms was that Stuart Glennie may be uh, too tech technological scientific and not the other dimensions of culture. And I think that's a good point. Um, Milan Kundera claimed that the main invention uh, of the modern era is the novel, because it opens up vast new terrains of subjectivity. Lewis Mumford, in his development of uh, an, a theory of technics and technology, claims that the first technical invention is the human self, the idea that the human self comes into being over time. And it included interiority as well as many other things. And so we have this development of subjective interiority, the, the rise of intimacy, comfort. If you read Vitold Chimsky's book, Home, things we take for granted of, of privacy, interiority, they, they are also coming up in the modern era. But they're threatened by this externalistic, robotic, machine-like entity. Lewis Mumford took a view of the past as a mega machine, of the advent of civilization as the first mega machine, almost totally human parts. It was a bureaucracy, kingship. These are all elements of what he called the mega machine. He saw, with the changes through history, the post-medieval time as a reinvention of the mega machine, beginning with the, the, the clock, the mechanical clock. Max Weber said that the asceticism of the monasteries, the rational asceticism kind of walked out and then everybody had to become an ascetic. Well, Mumford has a kind of an interesting variation. The clock is what walked out. The clock is what spread and became ubiquitous and became the master metaphor so that Kepler could say, I do not see the heavens as a divine being, but rather a kind of clockwork. And that's what Mumford saw as threatening us. The mega machine added a new system directive, he thought. That is to replace the human parts as much as possible, ultimately replacing all of the human parts. That's what he saw unless we could develop organic alternatives. Uh, unless we could, and, and, and these include what Václav Havel addressed in his essay, The Power of the Powerless. The soft, the soft virtues, decency, forgiveness, trust, love, uh, these have a long legacy. These go back. Empathy is not even human, or it, it goes back to other primates as well. And so uh, I think th there would be great agreement with Jaspers, Mumford certainly. I don't know if you can get Stuart Glennie on board, but, but that interiority is something that pr provides a possible counter buffer to overrun technology. One place where I would disagree um, is the notion of the meditative interiority, the stones you gave, beautiful image of the hunter. The difference, of course, is we now pick, let's say, the Buddha as the archetype for meditation. I mean, who is the prey? I mean, it is interior in that the prey is your own ego, and that's what I think is invented then, and that's what is the discontinuity from the hunter, and in that sense, it's internal rather than, quote, external. Yeah. 
In, in the Christian religion, the uh, 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 Paul Shepard talked about the sacred game, the predator prey, dramatic interplay. In Christianity, the sacred game, the sacred prey becomes anthropomorphized, and it is the Christ on the cross. But it evokes, I think, it's so powerful and poignant because it evokes that long legacy. One other question that I have started to ask a little bit more, um, and this is on the same theme, and there's also a slight, slight divergence. And I think it's analogous to one of the conversations that's happening amongst people who write about religion. And the question that they're asking is, can we even use the term religion to talk about a number of the practices and elements of civilization, human thought and practice that, that characterized pre-modern societies? <clears throat> like, can you speak of tribal religion? Does that even really make sense? Was, was there a religion or was there just a society in which gods and rituals and you know, um, all these other dimensions were, were just part and parcel of, of what it meant. And um, I think in that regard, another question that I, I ask about the Axial Age is, it's so familiar that it's easy to see Socrates as, you know, a philosophy professor. But he lived in a different world than, than us moderns. And, and I think Confucius did, I think Buddha did. All of these figures lived in, in completely different worlds. They changed the worlds they lived in, but the worlds they created, it, they didn't create our world. Um, they created certain developmental patterns that are, have shaped our world and influence it, but they created something else. And I think in that regard, the question of, did they create a world in which there was morality? Well, you know, morality as a concept, I think really begins to crystallize in you know, the 19th century. We're thinking about some sort of dimension of normative behavior that's separated from religion or from transcendent beliefs. So again, morality can be applied analogously, I think, to these axial traditions, and, and maybe moments of kind of proto-differentiation begin to appear, but, but morality as separate from theology in a way, like, well, it was still that there was a kind of a wholeness to that, that process. And then I think that might also apply to the question of interiority. Does the analogy of interiority really, is that the best analogy? Well, in a way, what we call inwardness, and certain people use the term inwardness, but what we call inwardness operates within a social imaginary in which there's sort of an external world, that's the world of objectivity and sort of matter and, and lifelessness, and then there's the interior world, which is the world of life and consciousness and reflection. Now, I think many of the axial figures, there, there was this differentiation between kind of world and transcendence, but what we call the inward was more like a ladder to the transcendent. It wasn't that you were just going in, you were sort of going up, or you were kind of going deeper into the world that was really out there. There was an objectivity to, to all of these, these phenomena. So I guess in that regard, you know, I think the, t the concept of inwardness is sort of an inversion of the concept of sort of a sort of a, a journey to the depths or to the heights of reality, which is sort of part of, of these axial traditions. And so the inward is also the outward and the kind of the upward in a way. Um, so again, that's just to sort of add a bit of, I think, complexity that might be you know, interesting and useful. One thing we haven't talked about is the uh, extreme differentiation of roles and of sort of subsectors of culture uh, in contemporary life. And uh, we are each in this room specialists. Uh, most of us teach at universities which have faculties of hundreds or thousands, uh, each specialized uh, from others. In fact, in most universities, to hold one's position, one has to be able to define oneself as differentiated from every other member of the faculty in one's specialty and ability to contribute to teaching and research. Uh, just to be in this room, we're dependent on architects who could design the building, structural engineers who made sure it would stand up, uh, the chemists who designed how to make this plastic top of the table, uh, the electronics engineers who uh, designed the video and sound equipment, and so forth. It's, it, it, the, this differentiation is huge. But 
One thing is it also requires of each of us who plays a role in this differentiated culture that we study deeply to master our, our specialized materials. Uh, we tend to view study as a lifelong thing. Uh, I have piles of books that I still hope to read uh, at home. <laughs> Uh, for Christmas and my birthday, my wife bought me four new bookcases to hold mostly the unread things. <laughs> and uh, um, so this speaks to the interiority that we each have to master a huge amount of material and in an individualized way in order to play our roles in everyday life. Thank you very much. But we still have a very, very little but time to reflect. Maybe some last bright comments. A brief question. Uh, I heard you say something about progress and you, you consider it to be a problematic notion. It is deeply problematic for philosophers of science. I mean, how you compare the incomparable? how you compare Aristotelian physics with Newtonian and Newtonian with, uh, you know, let us say, uh, Einsteinian and then quantum physics. The, the, the very meanings of terms change. And if you can't really compare without changing in some way the earlier paradigm or an earlier theory, then you cannot reduce the earlier theory to the later theory. And without such a reductionism, how can you make a claim that the later theory is a progress on the earlier one. Now, if this same idea is applied to these different periods of history, then how can we claim that a later period or a middle period is a, let us say, a, a progress on an earlier period? And there is, uh, you people have, all of you, pro you know, emphasized the discontinuity as well between the earlier and the later period. Uh, so, how is the later period, a progress on the earlier period. Uh, if you like to sort of enlighten us on that, it will be appreciated. Thank you. I don't hold much with progress, and I think the fact that you pick an example from theories and science is very telling. Uh, uh, my understanding of Jasper, Stuart, they're talking about philosophy of history. Um, Stuart Glennie was certainly, like Comte, somewhat, somewhat of a positivist, in, in the, as far as I can tell. Um, but uh, I would view this evolutionarily. And what progresses? Well, I, I think we get simultaneously both opportunities for the best possible. I, I think right now we're living in the best possible world we could in, could be, and it's also the worst possible simultaneously. I don't, I wouldn't really call that progress. I, I'm a long-term student of Charles Peirce, who was uh, not only a practicing scientist in a number of areas, but a philosopher of science as well. And, uh, you know, I have this model of mechanicocentric mind as the innermost contraction, anthropocentric mind, and animate mind. I'm arguing that it's all still there. It doesn't mean you throw out Newton. He's precise. He's, he's made progress with precision in his theory. But when you take that as true for the whole reality, you're ignoring other realities. It's, it's extrapolating too far from generalizing too much from the results. That's where I see Peirce really interesting in this regard. Uh, Peirce saw, took a view of much of modern philosophy and science as nominalistic, and he proposed a revised version of scholastic realism uh, where instead of go reverting to foundations, it reverts to the unlimited co community of inquirers. He allowed the place of signs as the essence of science, and he took real progress as possible. I, I, I believe in that as well. Uh, I think that Part of the problem of our runaway science and technology today is that we have foreshortened the, uh, what science needs to take account of. And uh, I, I look to Peirce for some of those kind of answers, you know, transferred from him. So, are we living in the best of possible universe or it is worst of possible? And next April, just in Easter or Desert Sunday, everyone will be here and we will continue. Thank you very much.